Currently, in treatment of hypertension, we use five major drug classes. And thiazide diuretics are one of them. Thiazide diuretics remain one of the most effective drugs in treatment of hypertension for years. We have to know that thiazide diuretics are subdivided on two types. It's thiazide-like diuretics as chlortalidone and indapamide, and classical thiazide diuretics as hydrochlorothiazide and bendrofluoside. Thiazide diuretics act on a distal convoluted tubule. And to explain their mechanism of action, first of all, we have to recall physiology of the distal convoluted tubule. Fluid that incomes to the distal convoluted tubule has a lot of sodium molecules. And recall that because sodium is osmotically active, sodium attracts water. So water molecules are always accompanying sodium molecules. In the distal convoluted tubule located sodium chloride co-transporter. The major function of this transporter is to provide reabsorption of sodium molecules. And as we know, water molecules move together with sodium. So once sodium and water molecules income into the cell, we transport them into the blood by sodium potassium exchanger. And it's the major reabsorption pathway of sodium and water molecules in the distal convoluted tubule. We have to know that intracellular sodium concentration regulates the activity of sodium calcium exchanger. The higher the concentration of sodium molecules inside the cell, the less active becomes sodium calcium exchanger. And the major function of sodium calcium exchanger is reabsorption of calcium from the urine into the blood. It's the only reabsorption pathway of calcium molecules in the distal convoluted tubule. Let's suppose that during reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule, three sodium and water molecules were reabsorbed into the blood. So, after the initial reabsorption in the proximal part of the distal convoluted tubule, there are just two sodium and two water molecules left. Sodium molecules stimulate the function of sodium potassium exchanger. With stimulation, this exchanger transports sodium molecules into the cell. But in return, this exchanger transports potassium molecules out of the cell into the urine. And potassium molecules for this transportation we take from the blood. Once potassium molecules income into the lumen, potassium stimulates the function of hydrogen-potassium exchanger. Hydrogen-potassium exchanger transports potassium molecules back into the cell, with simultaneous transportation of hydrogen molecules out of the cell. And hydrogen for this transportation we take from the blood. In the end, after the reabsorption, there is just one water molecule left, and this water molecule will be excreted into the urine. Thiazide diuretics block sodium chloride co-transporter. First of all, this causes decrease in reabsorption of sodium and water. As a result, the income of sodium and water molecules into the blood decrease. First of all, this causes decrease in blood sodium level, which potentially can cause hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is a well-known side effect of thiazide diuretics. Most commonly, hyponatremia occurs in old patients. And typically, hyponatremia occurs within the first two weeks of drug initiation. With decrease in water reabsorption, the income of water into the blood decrease. This causes decrease in total volume of fluid in the general circulation. And this provides two beneficial effects. First of all, it will cause decrease in blood pressure, and also it will improve edema. Basically, this effect is the major reason why we prescribe thiazide diuretics. With decrease in intracellular concentration of sodium, the activity of sodium calcium exchange increase. This will cause increase in reabsorption of calcium, so the income of calcium into the blood increase, and eventually, increase in calcium reabsorption will cause hypercalcemia. Thiazide diuretics are considered the best choice for patients that have hypertension and osteoporosis. 
simply because thiazides can increase blood calcium level, which in turn will cause increase in bone density. And with increase in bone density, the risk of fractures decrease. As we already know, the reason why thiazides can increase blood calcium level is because sodium and calcium reabsorptions are tightly connected due to the sodium-calcium exchange. And important that if person has normal calcium level and you will prescribe to him thiazides, the elevation of calcium will be mild, simply because we have parathyroid gland that regulates calcium concentration in the blood. So, if person on thiazides will have huge elevation of blood calcium level, it's not due to the diuretics. Probably, he has some problems with parathyroid gland as primary hyperparathyroidism. So, with decrease in sodium and water reabsorption, the greater quantity of sodium and water molecules will income into the distal regions. Increase in sodium concentration stimulates the activity of sodium-potassium ATPase, which results in increase in reabsorption of sodium and water molecules. But because reabsorption of sodium occurs simultaneously with excretion of potassium, this pump basically takes potassium from the blood and excretes these potassium molecules into the lumen. So now the concentration of potassium in the tubular lumen increases. Increase in potassium concentration stimulates the activity of hydrogen potassium ATPase, which transports some amount of potassium back into the cell. So this pump, to some extent, decreases the loss of potassium molecules into the urine, but it cannot save all potassium molecules. And because of this, with time, thiazides can cause hypokalemia. So, as we already know, Thiazides cause hypokalemia by indirect mechanism. Statistically, in patients on thiazides diuretics, blood potassium level decreases by 0.5 milliequivalent per liter. Long-term consumption of thiazides and loop diuretics can cause 15% decrease in potassium level, which is quite a significant. The most serious potential complication of hypokalemia is the development of arrhythmias. We should be especially careful with thiazides in patients on cardiac glycosides, because they can precipitate digitalis toxicity. The second problem is that hypokalemia can cause mild increase in blood pressure. And last but not least, statistically, patients with hypokalemia have increased incidence of strokes, which is also not very good. We have to know that hypokalemia affects blood glucose level. Hypokalemia causes decrease in insulin secretion, which in turn causes increase in blood glucose level. And to explain this feature, we have to recall insulin secretion. So here we have pancreatic beta cell. Beta cells have GLUT1 transporter. This transporter provides transportation of glucose into the cell. Also, they have ATP sensitive potassium channels. And we have to know that in rest state, potassium channels are opened. So, because potassium is intracellular iron, which means that the concentration of potassium inside the cell is much higher than the concentration of potassium outside the cell. While potassium channels are opened, potassium constantly leaves cell. Also, beta cells have voltage-gated calcium channels. And in rest state, calcium channels are closed. So calcium, which is extracellular iron, in rest state, cannot enter into the cell. Also, beta cells have intracellular vesicles. And intracellular vesicles have already formed insulin and C-peptide. When glucose enters into the beta cell, glucose undergo phosphorylation by glucokinase to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate undergo glycolysis with subsequent degradation in Krebs cycle and electron transport chain that results in production of ATP molecules. ATP molecules activate ATP-sensitive potassium channels. 
with activation potassium channels close. If potassium channels close, potassium begin to accumulate inside the cell. With increase in positively charged potassium ions, membrane potential increase. For example, from minus 70, membrane potential increase to minus 50. And the state when membrane potential becomes more positive, we call depolarization. And depolarization triggers activation of voltage-gated calcium channels. If calcium channels open, calcium by concentration gradient begin to enter into the cell. And increase in intracellular calcium triggers exocytosis of vesicle with release of insulin and C-peptide into the blood. The fate of C-peptide is rather prosaic. C-peptide incomes to the kidneys, and kidneys excrete C-peptide from the organism into the urine. Insulin in the blood stimulates tissues to consume more glucose, and because glucose begins to income to the tissues, glucose level in the blood decreases. In addition to this, beta cells have GLP-1 receptor, which provides regulation of insulin secretion. Glucagon-like peptide 1 in the blood binds to GLP-1 receptor. With binding, receptor becomes activated. Activation of GLP-1 receptor stimulates closing of potassium channels and opening of calcium channels. As a result, more calcium molecules income to the cell. And with increase in intracellular calcium level, exocytosis of insulin increase. Interesting that the amount of glucagon-like peptide in the blood is controlled by a specific enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4. This enzyme provides inactivation of glucagon-like peptide. In simple words, DPP4 destroys GLP-1 molecules. Nowadays, we know that hypertension and insulin resistance are tightly connected. What is also important for us is that some antihypertensive drugs can increase the risk of nuanced diabetes type 2. And Tizer's diuretics are one of them. Among patients treated with diuretics or beta blockers, the incidence of nuanced diabetes type 2 is 5.6 cases per thousand patients a year, which is significant. The major reason why Tizer's can cause increase in blood glucose level is because Tizer's diuretics cause hypokalemia, and hypokalemia cause decrease in insulin secretion from pancreatic beta cells. Diuretics cause hypokalemia. With hypokalemia, the amount of potassium ions outside the cell decrease. This cause increase in potassium concentration gradient, so now more potassium ions will leave the cell. As a result, the amount of potassium ions inside the cell decrease. Decrease in potassium intracellular concentration causes decrease in membrane potential, which results in decrease in magnitude of depolarization. And the weaker is the depolarization, the smaller amount of calcium channels become open. This causes decrease in calcium influx into the cell and the smaller becomes the concentration of calcium ions inside the cell, the less active becomes exocytosis. As a result, the secretion of insulin and C-peptide into the blood decrease, and with decrease in insulin concentration, glucose uptake by the tissues decrease, so more glucose molecules will remain in the blood. As a result, blood glucose level increase. So, it's a mechanism how diuretics through hypokalemia cause hyperglycemia. We have to know that diuretics cause reversible hyperglycemia. Simply because in this case, hyperglycemia is caused by hypokalemia. So, once we restore potassium level, glucose level will also normalize. Interesting that one milli equivalent decrease in potassium level cause 10 mg per deciliter increase in blood glucose level. So, if we give to a patient Tizer's diuretics and we do not want to cause hyperglycemic state, it will be wise to give him potassium supplements. In addition to this, 
Increase in potassium interluminal concentration cause overstimulation of hydrogen potassium ATPase, which begin to transport potassium molecules into the cell. By this transportation, organism tries to minimize the loss of potassium ions, but transportation of potassium into the cell occurs simultaneously with transportation of hydrogen into the tubal lumen. So by this, urine becomes more acidic. But because we take hydrogen molecules from the blood, this will cause decrease in concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood, and this will cause the state that we call metabolic alkalosis. So, metabolic alkalosis is a common side defect of thiazide and loop diuretics. The reason why alkalosis develops is diuretic-induced increase in acid excretion. In this case, it was induced by increase in interluminal potassium concentration, because potassium stimulates the activity of hydrogen potassium ATPase. And as we see, the end result of thiazide diuretic effect is mild increase in water excretion. We call this mild increase in diuresis. It's exactly the reason why we call them diuretics. One of the signature side effects of thiazide diuretics is hyperuricemia. Thiazides stimulate the absorption of uric acid in the proximal tubule. The mechanism is that once patients intake thiazides, thiazides undergo transportation by organic anion transporter into the cell of the proximal convoluted tubule in exchange for decarboxylic acid. After this, thiazides undergo the second transportation. Organic anion transporter pushes thiazides into the tubular lumen, and in exchange, urate molecules go into the cell. And once urate molecules appear inside the cell, cell transport urate molecules into the blood, and it's a mechanism how thiazides stimulate the reabsorption of urate molecules. And with increase in reabsorption, the uric acid level in the blood increase, which is very dangerous for patients with gout. And the last side effect that we have to know is dyslipidemia. We know that thiazide diuretics in high doses can increase total cholesterol level by 4% with simultaneous increase in LDL cholesterol by 10%, which is significant, especially for elder patients who are already at risk of atherosclerosis. Dyslipidemia usually occurs with high doses of diuretics, and unfortunately, we do not know the exact mechanism. So, based on side effects that we have discussed, thiazide diuretics have several contraindications. First of all, we try not to use them in patients who have low potassium level, because thiazides cause hypokalemia. Also, we try to avoid them in patients with glucose intolerance, metabolic syndrome or diabetes, because thiazides decrease insulin secretion, which lead to increase in blood glucose level. If person has high calcium level, probably thiazides are not the best choice because they increase the reabsorption of calcium. And for sure, if patient has gout, thiazides are not the best choice, because thiazide diuretics stimulate reabsorption of uric acid, and increase in uric acid level can cause gout exacerbation.